Une lecture de l'Évangile de Matthieu. Gloire à toi Seigneur. Écoutez notre parabole. Il y avait un propriétaire qui planta une vigne. Il l'entoura d'une haie, il creusa un pressoir et construisit une tour. Puis il alloua à des vignerons et partit en voyage. Lorsque le temps de la récolte fut arrivé, il envoya ses serviteurs vers les vignerons pour recevoir sa part de récolte. Mais les vignerons s'emparèrent de ses serviteurs. Ils bâtirent l'un, tuèrent l'autre et lapidèrent le troisième. Il envoya encore d'autres vignerons, d'autres serviteurs, et en plus grand nombre que les premiers. Et les vignerons les traitèrent de la même manière. Enfin, il envoya vers eux son fils en se disant, « Ils auront du respect pour mon fils. » Mais quand les vignerons virent le fils, ils se dirent d'entre eux, « Voilà l'héritier. Venez, tuons-le et emparons-nous de son héritage. » Et ils s'emparèrent de lui, le jetèrent hors de la vigne et le tuèrent. Maintenant, lorsque le maître de la vigne viendra, que fera-t-il à ses vignerons Ils lui répondirent, « Il fera mourir misérablement ses misérables. » et louera les, la vigne à d'autres vignerons qui lui donneront sa part de récolte au moment voulu. Jésus leur dit, « N'avez-vous jamais lu dans les Écritures La pierre qu'ont rejeté ceux qui construisaient est devenue la pierre angulaire. C'est l'œuvre du Seigneur et c'est un prodige à nos yeux. C'est pourquoi, je vous le dis, le royaume de Dieu vous sera enlevé et sera donné à un peuple qui en produira les fruits. » Celui qui tombera sur cette pierre s'y brisera, et celui sur qui elle tombera sera écrasé. Après avoir entendu ces paraboles, les chefs des prêtres et les pharisiens comprirent que c'était d'eux que Jésus parlait. Ils cherchaient à l'arrêter, mais ils redoutaient les, les réactions de la foule parce qu'elle considérait Jésus comme un prophète. Acclamons la parole de Dieu. So this morning I'm returning to my series on the biblical drama in six acts. So a couple of weeks ago I looked at act one, God's good creation. I'm just going to trigger a bit of our memory for, uh, from what I said, some highlights from that a couple of weeks ago. So through the stages of creation, God says this creation is good. And then when God gets to the creation of humanity, God says This is really good. So a central element in that first act is that creation is fundamentally good. And a second element is that humanity is described as bearing the image of God. And this means several things. So I'm just going to highlight three things that I mentioned from the last time to refresh our memories this morning. First of all, this, this theme of humanity bearing the image of God, first of all, means that people carry this, this remarkable dignity, making all people equal before God. And therefore, all people to be equally valued and treated by each other. There's a radical, divine, egalitarian value here, of God's, uh, how God views humanity and how we are to view humanity in the very first chapter of Scripture. Then second, The image of God language is taken from ancient Near Eastern cultures. And what it means in those cultures is that the king or the ruler or the pharaoh bears the image of the gods to carry the responsibility to oversee society and everything else. But in Genesis, the image of God is applied to everybody, not just the pharaohs or the rulers. And so this means humans carry, all humans carry responsibility to be God's representatives on earth, conveying God's interests on earth, beginning with the stewardship of God's property, this planet. So that was the second point. Third, in Christian theology, 
the image of God has come to uh, represent or speak of a couple other themes in terms of uh, the, the, the qualities, key features of God that we possess. Creativity and relationality. So we're going to be talking about those later. <clears throat> so just to refresh our memory, humanity made the image of God equal dignity, responsibility, relationality, creativity. Now that's a very powerful uh, image and description of us. Then we come now to Act 2. So Act 1, God's good creation. <clears throat> Act 2 is often called the fall. So <clears throat> this refers to Adam and Eve, uh, their fall from grace by rejecting God's instructions not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There's no mention in there of apples or pears or bananas or anything else. Just the, tr the fruit of that particular tree is the knowledge of good and evil that they're told not to eat from. And so in the story described by Genesis, the, that moment of disobedience to God's instructions was the harmful turning point for humanity. However, I'm not a fan of this label. Because it really confines Acts 2 to those few verses in Genesis 3 where that happens, where that describes you know, their, their disobedience. But whereas Act 2 is really about the general moral decay of humanity. In other words, God's creation started out very good, but then the human part of that creation swiftly and depressingly starts to fall apart. And why is that? Well, because humanity chooses autonomy. Self-choice and self-wisdom over God's own choices and God's wisdom. And once humanity replaced hearts and minds set on God's ways with their own ways or chooses to manipulate God's ways to their own ends, our own ends, then humanity begins to rapidly fall apart. And so I prefer to call Act 2 humanity's moral decay. Act 1, God's good creation. Act 2, humanity's moral decay. <clears throat> I think this title captures uh, a little, a little better, the scope of the problem and its enduring consequences. And so it's helpful here to step back and compare uh, this to uh, Act 2 to ancient Near Eastern cultures of the time. So ancient Near Eastern cultures and, and, and literature was uh, about the chaos of the gods. All the infighting and power politics and sexual exploits of the gods. But in contrast to those surrounding cultures in ancient Near Eastern uh, literature, Acts 2 of the biblical drama is about the chaos within humanity because of humanity's uh, turning away from God's ways. And so he, Act, two, Act, Act 2 places the focus on us. So, there are, and so now as Act 2 uh, progresses through Genesis and through the rest of the, you know, the scriptures, there are lots of stories. In addition to you know, the Adam and Eve uh, story, there is, for instance, uh, the story of righteous Noah. So, you know, Noah is used by God to do this great rescue job uh, in the, from, from uh, a great flood. But after the, the, after the flood and things settle down, life returns to some kind of normalcy, uh, Noah behaves abysmally. So in chapter 6, he gets drunk and he lies around the family tent naked. And his sons have to cover him up. So he, uh, in his drunken state... And then later, Noah is so embarrassed by what he's done that he has to find someone else to blame. So the blame game we see with uh, Adam and Eve, we see the blame game again very quickly, just a couple uh, chapters later, with Noah. And so Noah decides not to, uh, for some reason, he can't, decides not to blame his sons. So he picks a grandson and blames his grandson for his own behavior. His grandson had nothing to do with it. Canaan had nothing to do with it. But he can't take responsibility for his own actions, so he finds someone who can't protect himself and blames that one. In this case, his grandson Noah. Uh, his grandson Canaan. So then the rest of the Old Testament 
carries on from there, filled with everything from family quarrels to family murders, from civil war within Israel to constant wars between nations. And so the Hebrew scriptures paint a very dismal view of humanity. Lots of deceit, lots of murder, lots of idolatry. We could say that the Old Testament is unrelentingly honest in its descriptions of human failing, including remarkably by the people who are central to God's story and God's work. King David is you know, a, a classic example of this. <clears throat> he is, he is uh, held up through, through Jewish history and through the scriptures as, this, um, as the greatest ruler of all time, and yet... The scriptures have no hesitation about describing his many flaws and deep failings. Again, this is in contrast to ancient Near Eastern literature in which kings are always described in glowing terms of perfection. And yet the Hebrew scriptures are unique in their honest descriptions of the moral failings of their leaders, even their best leaders, let alone others. So... It's remarkable how quickly humanity, which God initially declares very good, descends into moral and behavioral chaos. And so we heard these words just spoken a few minutes ago from Genesis 6. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how, the corrupt, how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. That word corrupt is used three times there, just in that last verse there. So let's go back for a moment to those four key elements to the image of God. In humanity's rebellion against God, we see each of these deeply damaged or corrupted. So, for instance, equal dignity. We see this corrupt in all kinds of ways. The term we often use today is dehumanizing. So a classic example through human history is slavery. Nothing dehumanizes others worse than slavery. And slavery is found through you know, all, of, all, all of human history. Including, including archaeological remains that indicate slave, slavery patterns in societies even before written records. Uh, another way we dehumanize or don't recognize equal dignity of others is how we treat the poor or the disabled or the homeless. When Jesus told us to invite the homeless and the poor and the disabled uh, into our homes for celebrations and meals, he was restoring their dignity. And he was calling us to restore their dignity. When Jesus said, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first, he was talking about restoring the dignity of those whose dignity has been denied or crushed. And when we use language that belittles others, or we tell untruths or half-truths about others, we are diminishing their dignity. And so the moral decay of Act 2 includes diminishing, even crushing, the dignity of people. We also see responsibility corrupted in all kinds of ways. People failing in their responsibilities to care. From care for our own bodies, to care for children, to care for other vulnerable people, to care for our environment, to care for God's mission, and so on. So many ways we do not live up to our responsibilities. A case close to my heart here is children. We know from Roman literature that Christians were known across the empire, the Roman Empire, for taking care of abandoned or vulnerable children. Today we would call this adopting or fostering, and this is a particular responsibility for Christians. Regardless, the larger picture here is that humanity's fulfillment of its many responsibilities has been corrupted. Well, then we see relationality is also corrupted as well. We all know the experience of corrupted or broken relationships. I bet every person in this room has at least one broken relationship in their life. I know I do. I'm sure each one of us does. I've talked about this uh, 
on previous occasions. But many, you know, there are many ways in which, you know, we end up breaking relationships. Uh, we attribute false intentions to others. We spread false comments. We speak harshly. We speak before we listen. Uh, there's a long list, and we all know the long list of, of ways that we intentionally or accidentally harm or damage or corrupt relationships. And of course, our relationality, relationship with God, is corrupted as well. And so in the Old Testament, this is seen particularly through the constant effort of biblical leaders to bring the people back from idolatry. So this is a constant struggle in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament literature, of, of, the, uh, of, of the leaders trying to bring people back from idolatry. Of course, idolatry is not just the worship of idols, instead of you know, worshiping Yahweh. Idolatry is the attitude of giving higher value to anything than we do to God. Anything in our lives that we place higher value over God. And so we break relationality with God and with people. And then finally, creativity. We can use our creativity, of course, in ways that harm others. I have a friend who was a professional photographer, and he was in the advertising industry. Uh, but he eventually left the advertising industry because he felt his photographic creativity was being abused because the advertising agencies manipulated his photos to deceive consumers. And so uh, he felt he needed to leave the industry. I'm not saying everyone has to leave that. It's not the implication I'm drawing, but it's, what I'm painting there is a picture of this friend who felt his creativity was being abused uh, by others. There's so many ways in which our creativity, which is inherently good and in the image of God, gets corrupted as well and used harmfully. So, and one of the saddest parts of all this is that we pass on each of these types of corruption and brokenness, not just to people in the present, but also to future generations as well. We carry both the strengths and the brokenness of generations before us, and we pass on our strengths and our brokenness to future generations. Now, the, the corruption that the Old Testament talks about is generally corruption of conscious choice. We choose autonomy from God in our choices, so these choices cause harm. But in the New Testament, we see hints uh, of corruption or brokenness at subconscious levels as well. And so, for instance, there's this classic line from Paul that Paul writes in Romans 7. I don't understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want to do, but instead I do the very thing I don't want to do, or the thing I, I actually hate. For I don't do the good that I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do is what I do. And why is that? Because there's deeper stuff happening within us. So in effect, the corruption of human dignity, responsibility, relationships, and creativity occurs through both conscious and subconscious uh, levels. Sometimes through our own choices, uh, <clears throat> consciously, sometimes through the brokenness we bear, uh, through other just life experiences. And so this is the picture of human corruption painted by Act 2 of the biblical drama. A picture of deep moral rot in humanity. This does not mean the good elements have been completely erased. In some Christian theology, there is that view that uh, the good elements have been completely erased by our sinful corruption. Math, uh, in, in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus says this, which I think is interesting. If you then, who are evil, and here... Um, we're not quite sure who Jesus is talking to. It could be the Pharisees, it could be, could be others. This is a part of, um, uh, that says Romans 7 down there. It, uh, it should not say that. It should say Matthew 7, uh, and verse 11. But this is a series of just uh, general sayings that, have been re that Matthew records from Jesus. So there's not any larger context around this. So whoever he, Jesus is saying this to, if you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children... How much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask? And so the part I'm focusing on there is 
the orange. Few then who are evil know how to give good gifts. Even those who are evil can do good. So part of the complexity of our fallenness and our brokenness is, is how good and evil uh, get mixed together. The good is not gone in humanity with the corruption, but good just has to work harder to be seen and to come forth. And we need more, more of God's grace for that, which I'll talk, be talking about in a future act. So, if you're feeling that this picture is particularly or excessively pessimistic, or maybe you're thinking it's realistic, what are you thinking? Is this a realistic picture portrayed as by scripture of human nature, or is it excessively pessimistic? I tend to lean towards the realistic. Regardless, what is God going to do about this? Okay? After all, it's God's creation. God created a creation in which this could, be the, could come about. And so we could say God has responsibility to do something about this. I think that would be fair to say. And so the answer to that comes in Acts 3. Act 3. Not Acts 3. Act 3. My next sermon. But let me give you a quick uh, preview here. God's plan in response to humanity's moral decay is to create a people group who are mandated by God to provide the world with an alternate vision, a corruption-fighting vision for how to live, to be a people who will be a moral and cultural and spiritual light to the nations. This people is called Israel. And so in Act 3, Act 3 in the biblical drama is the creation and life of Israel. And so I'll say more about that in my next sermon in the series. Now I'll open the floor for any comments or and discussion. And the tech team will pull out a mic. Any thoughts, disagreements, and other, other insights? Michael? This is maybe a Pandora's box or a rabbit hole, but we, we're reading a lot about Israel these days, and, and you just mentioned Israel, and I know you were talking about. Anyway, it, it's not quite related to what you were talking about, but how to respond to all of that, because, you know, we want to show compassion. and Anyway, I, I realize it's a rabbit hole, and I don't want to put you on the spot or anything, but it's been on my mind. <laughs> it's been on my mind. Uh, thank you, Michael. I was uh, anticipating someone raising that, um, and because I think it's on uh, all of our minds, what's uh, ha- been happening in uh, Israel and Gaza the last 48 hours, uh, and historically as well. Um, I'm not going to comment on it beyond saying um, uh, we need to be praying, continually to be praying, <clears throat> and I will probably say more about it when I get to Act 3. But it's, uh, it's absolutely a relevant question. Uh, if it's, uh, <clears throat> it is a Pandora's box, but that's okay. Because um, it's, it's something to talk about and form Christian theology on. And so uh, you have flagged uh, an item for Act 3. So thank you for that. Amel. Yeah. Thank you for your message. And I think... If I can summarize all what you said is that when Jesus told us to be reminded, love your God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself, and this is what I believe is the biggest failure, because when you dehumanize somebody, and I'm not going into politics, I'm like Marcello or anybody who commented, it's more that when you don't see others are equal to you, then they're not deserving of all your love, all your uh, care, or anything. Even God should not treat them that way either, because they're not equal. So love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. So under the love your neighbor as yourself is completely this, this theology, going back to Genesis 1, of we are all equal before God. We're all children of God. And um, so, absolutely. Thank you, Lamel. 
Any last thoughts or comments this morning on, on our theme? Last comment, Ted. Ed. Thank you, Pastor Chris, uh, for um, just what you shared uh, this morning. And my, my takeaway, and I'm, I'm hoping by sharing it, I can kind of cement it a little bit. Um, as you talked about equal dignity uh, and just the ways that we violate that. <clears throat> and I thought, wow, uh, we were all made, like you said, you know, in, in old societies, it was the kings, the rulers, who had that image of God on them, but that God gives that to everyone. And so that we're all so very, like we're all in that position of responsibility and even rulership uh, over, over some things. Um, and so even just small things of dignifying others, uh, acknowledging them, you know, not ignoring anyone, but, but saying hello, <laughs> uh, doing these things. And I'm thinking about that with our neighbors and uh, just, just small gestures, but uh, what, what is landing with me from what you said in that part of the message is just how grave an offense a, a infringement on someone's dignity is. Like it's not a small thing. Right. Thank you, Ed. Absolutely. Well, I'll now I invite you to please stand and we will affirm our faith in the words of the Philippians Creed. Jesus... In very nature, God, 